Merci. Our chair asked me something very typical for somebody like me, I should say, like all of us working in the European Commission. Can you please expand the competence of your talk? He actually asked me to add a point to what I had in mind, but reduce the time. This is what happens to the European Commission all the time. We are, asked, you, we are asked to take on more competence in the process of European integration, but also to please reduce the budget we can uh, deal with, the human resources, and so on. So I will play the game chair. I feel quite at, uh, at home. So uh, speaking of this, uh, I work at the European Commission in the Department for Research, and I'm actually very pleased to have been part of a previous step in Brussels, the workshop we organized with Jean-Claude Thibault, Joao Marques de Almeida at BEPA, and our colleagues, of course, of the Haut Commissariat du Plan. Uh, the proceedings are available on the website for those of you who are involved. This was more of an expert workshop. Um, and I'm very happy to be here uh, this time, also on behalf of our Directorate General. Well, coming from Brussels, we are in this kind of uh, situation of, uh, for instance, uh, having uh, no agreement on the multi-annual financial framework and not even about our annual budget. So this seems to be a very loomy period for anyone working in the European Union and in Brussels. And everybody is evoking, for very good reasons, the economic crisis and financial crisis and the euro crisis with regard to the uh, monetary uh, union. However, I must say, uh, maybe inspired by another writer and philosopher called Antonio Gramsci when he was in uh, the prison in fascist times, we have to act on the basis of uh, the pessimism of reason but the optimism of will, meaning we need to be sharp in our analysis but not to be let down by how hard things might be. And um, maybe in that spirit, I think that the maybe paradoxical situation that we experience once again in a crisis in the European Union is that by being so sharp for, uh, unfortunately, bad reasons about the difficulties of our monetary union, we became more aware of the fact that a monetary union without a stronger economic governance at the European level cannot go ahead. So we might paradoxically, through this crisis, improve uh, a lack which was there before. The other point is that, as I said, we do not have a multi-annual financial framework. Hopefully we will have it beginning of next year. Uh, there are discussions about cutting the budget, as I mentioned, but there is an agreement which touches upon the topic I will actually discuss after this introduction prompted by the chair, which is about the fact that there is agreement that even if we have an economic crisis, we need to be even more prudent and cautious about public spending at the European Union level and within the countries. We should not cut on research and innovation because this is one of the areas where we can find solutions to the crisis we have and particularly taking into account the long term. In this context, we are also aware that uh, research has dimensions which are from local to global, and the uh, program where I work is in fact international scientific cooperation, and just in September we issued a communication on a new strategy for international scientific cooperation, which wants to make the European research program uh, the most open to any uh, partner in the world uh, kind of program. It's already the most open of the programs, but will continue to be so in addition to have targeted dimensions. Now the question for, the, for my speech here and my contribution is why research cooperation should be a key component of cooperation in the Atlantic. And the short answer, and I could close here and give all the rest of my time, is because knowledge is power. And I guess that all of us can make sense of this uh, very short sentence. Yes, knowledge is power in economic terms, in strategic terms, in human capital terms, in cultural terms, and maybe others that I'm, that I'm forgetting. So very quickly, why research and innovation are important for the topic we are discussing in this section about 
economic development and growth? Um, well, first is that some of you, most of you, when giving examples of what makes us uh, link together is in fact the issue of interconnectivity. And research and innovation definitely can help this interconnectivity, whether in transport, in ICT, uh, in environmental terms and prudent use of, of uh, our common resources, whether it's climate change, whether it's water, the ocean, and so on, need to have the best available knowledge, technologies, and innovation at disposal. One of the previous speakers, Miriam Ben Salah Chagrun, also pointed to the fact that we need uh, to support uh, economic development with regard also to uh, an enhanced regulatory framework and standards and so on. And again, research and innovation are extremely important part of any process of standardization and uh, designing a product and process uh, standards in an innovative way, both uh, with regard to, again, use of resources, economic costs, locations, and so on. Most of the speakers have been identifying some of the common challenges, which are most often global challenges, but with local or regional dimension. I don't need to repeat. Energy, climate change, water resources, health issues, migration, uh, demographic changes uh, connected to that. Definitely, research and innovation are important resources and tools to tackle all of those challenges from the identification of what the challenges are, the trends that they will take, and others. We have been discussing about the fact that we are living in a changing multipolar system. And actually, the changes are uh, also changing the scientific map. We are moving quite uh, quickly and uh, decisively from a situation where basically the superpower in science were three, Europe, the US, Japan, and this is definitely much less the case. Uh, the so-called BRICS, uh, particularly Brazil, India, and China are uh, overtaking uh, part of, uh, of this, even if uh, in terms of uh, GDP dedicated to research and innovation, uh, publication, and so on, there is still uh, how to say, uh, quite a level, but in prospects, those are in fact uh, important techno powers. And there are what analysts called pockets of excellence in science and research in many developing countries, including, of course, uh, in this area, and of course, in the Atlantic basin more uh, broadly. So, this is also a matter of harvesting the best talent in this changing multipolar science world uh, to tackle then the global challenges. Last but not least, science diplomacy is an important component of having better uh, cooperation in key countries and regions. For us, science diplomacy is also a way of supporting our external policy in the Union, but definitely in an Atlantic cooperation, this is a means. We have several means so far, 20 bilateral science and technology agreement, including with Morocco including with Brazil, including with South Africa, to mention some of the Atlantic Basin, in addition, of course, to US, Canada, and others. We have regional initiatives. My colleague, Armando Studilio will present the maritime strategy for the Atlantic Ocean, so I can save time on that. There will be research components with regard to that. Uh, recently, the issue of an Atlantic partnership was discussed in the context of EU-South African agreement, for instance, and I'm sure this workshop will put that in the map even further. And with this, I thank you all for your attention, and my time is over.